Tonight we're on the uh, sixth trumpet. This is part six of that. So we've been putting a lot of Sunday evenings into this to get to the point that we're at. Uh, I'll just let you know that we have one more lesson on the sixth trumpet and then we will be getting to the seventh trumpet. So uh, be prepared for that. Uh, and as we get finished with the seventh trumpet, we're going to be taking a little break from the revelation, have some other things that are very important that we want to, uh, to look at, but uh, probably this fall we'll be getting back to revelation starting on chapter 12, which there's some pretty exciting things that we see in chapters 12, 13, and 14. That'll be our next division. But tonight we are looking in Revelation starting at uh, verse 3 of chapter 11. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, listen now, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Wow. Powerful reading tonight. Now, we learned the identities of these two witnesses in our last lecture. The first witness is Jesus Christ himself as the Word of God that makes atonement for the sins of the world and by whom we can be cleansed from all sin and unrighteousness. The second witness is the Holy Spirit who brings about the new birth and indwells the redeemed so that they manifest the righteousness of Christ in their lives. Now we find the glorified Christ as the head of his church and using the power of the Holy Spirit prophesying for a symbolic period of 1260 days. But notice, there is an impediment to their prophesying. The two witnesses are clothed in sackcloth. What is sackcloth? Well, sackcloth is a cloth of coarse texture, always dark in color, and made of goat's hair. It was used mainly for making sacks. That's why they called it sackcloth but was also worn by people during times of mourning and deep grief. And you will recall that when the sixth seal was opened, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. There we learned that at the end of the Reformation, the visible church at large hid the light of the gospel through its divisions, creeds, and rituals and various organizational structures. Now that sackcloth did not originate with the Reformation. In actuality, it was carried over from the influence of Catholicism where it all began. Now Catholicism, both in its papal and orthodox forms, hid the Word and the Spirit of God behind the draping of tradition, ritual, and the teaching of the post-Nicene Fathers. At this time, it was necessary for a pseudo-Christianity that was both formal and apostate 
to hide the gospel from the people. First, it kept the people ignorant of the truths about sin, redemption, and holiness, substituting ritual and so-called sacraments for the new birth. Second, because the people were ignorant, it protected the clergy from criticism and reaction from the people. In other words, it gave the clergy license to do whatever they wanted. Verse 5 tells us there is a consequence that is attached to this. It says, if anyone wants to harm them, meaning the word and the spirit, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. An apostate clergy may enjoy power over the lives of people and the material benefits they gain through that power, but God takes notice. God takes notice. Fire, the emblem of the Holy Spirit, proceeds from the witnesses in the form of God's judgments and devours them. Now there are real incidents in history where God actually struck people dead in a unique and providential way. Remember King Herod in Acts chapter 12, verses 22 and 23? Well, let's, let's look at that. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. Priests, bishops, popes, monks and the like that pillaged the church in the name of Christ were not necessarily eaten by worms in their lifetimes, but soon after they died, they faced God with all the evil they had done in the name of Je Jesus and the church. Seconds after they died, they found themselves in a place, according to Jesus in Mark 9, 44, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That fire which proceeds from the two witnesses torments them for all eternity. However, the greater torment that afflicted them was this, that the word of God grew and multiplied. They were not interested in the word of God growing and multiplied. And when it did, it aggravated them. So in spite of their efforts to harm the two witnesses, the word of God grew and affected even lives that were supposedly under their control. Now Jesus also says of anyone that wants to harm the two witnesses, he must be killed in this manner. During the reign of Catholicism, the church literally killed thousands upon thousands of people that turned to the Word and to the Spirit of God. But in reality, they only sent those saints to their eternal reward in the presence of Christ. Those that harm the two witnesses are to be killed. Now remember, this is not a physical killing. It is symbolic of something. Well, what is it symbolic of? Well, Hosea tells us what kind of killing this is in Hosea chapter 6, verse 5. He's quoting God, I have slain them by the words of my mouth. As the visible church at large took away the word and the spirit from the people, the very word they denied destroys them. The Word is the fire of the Holy Spirit that proceeds from the mouth of the two witnesses and devours them. These murderers today are still facing the eternal judgment of God in eternal torment. But friends, this is not just limited to a time long ago. Religious persecution by people professing to be the church 
still exists today and it will continue to exist until Jesus comes. So let us be careful not to harm the Word and the Spirit of God in both their spiritual state and in the lives of God's people. Now the witnesses have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. The sackcloth that hid the word and spirit essentially let the apostate clergy have its way for a long time identified in this part of the vision as 1260 days. The church at large beggared and hid the preaching of the word and disallowed the moving of the Holy Spirit in the visible church. In response, Jesus backed off and let apostasy take its course as we have seen from our study of the letters to the churches of Asia in the beginning of our study of the book of Revelation. The witnesses restricted the power of heaven in their days as often as they de desired. Now this is a negative thing with regard to the visible church, but it is also has a hidden blessed truth within this thing. Okay? A negative and a blessing. The powers of the two witnesses actually held back the power of the church so that when people that actually reached out to Jesus through the spiritual darkness, they were brought into salvation in spite of the gross spiritual darkness that surrounded them. Even in the darkness of the dark ages, when the word of God was not being preached in the churches, yet the Spirit of God was active in the lives of people, and people that cared, people that desired the right relationship with God, when they would reach out through that darkness, the hand of Christ, as it were, would take hold of them and bring salvation to their souls. Yes, it was rare that people walked in New Testament salvation, but thank God some people did. And history does record that for us. Now the witnesses prophesy in sackcloth for 1260 days. Albert Barnes at the conclusion of his commentary on Revelation chapter 11 makes an assumption based on his thinking that chapter 10 preceding this refers to the Reformation. He thinks that the sixth trumpet in chapter 11 refers to the necessity at the time of the Reformation of ascertaining what was the true church, of reviving the scripture doctor respecting the atonement and justification, and of drawing correct lines as to membership in the church. And he is correct in that thinking. But he goes on to say about the 1260 days. All this has reference according to this interpretation to the state of the church while the papacy would have the ascendancy or during the what he calls the 1260 years in which it would trample down the church as if the holy city were in the hands of the Gentiles. Assuming this to be the correct exposition, then what is here said must relate to that period, for it is with reference to that same time, the period of 1,203 score days, or 1,260 years, that it is said the witnesses would prophesy clothed in sackcloth. If this be so, then what is here stated must be supposed to occur during the ascendancy of the papacy, and we agree with that, and must mean in general that during that long period of apostasy, darkness, corruption, and sin, there would be faithful witnesses for the truth 
who though they were few in number would be sufficient to keep the truth who though they were excuse me would be sufficient to keep up the knowledge of the truth on the earth and bear testimony against the prevailing errors and abominations Barnes mixes a few things together but his assessment of the uh, church age during the time of the papacy is quite correct. Barnes, while he identifies the papacy, mixes the time of the Gentiles with the time of the two witnesses because the 42 months of the Gentiles and the 1260 days are the same amount of time. And therefore, Barnes concludes that they are coinciding rather than contiguous. And we've studied this and we see that the times of the Gentiles is one time and then this time of the two witnesses follows that. So they are contiguous, not contemporary. So he captures the essence of the condition we have described as the time of the two witnesses and consequently the time of the papacy a long period of apostasy, darkness, corruption, and sin. Verse 7 introduces another complicated picture concerning these same two witnesses under the sixth trumpet. When they finish their testimony, we are told that the beast that ascends out of the bottom pit, bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. From this, it is evident that this action takes place after, after the 1260 days in which the two witnesses prophesy in sackcloth. Here, we find a beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, making war with the two witnesses and eventually overcoming them and killing them. We encountered the bottomless pit in the sounding of the fifth trumpet, which we learned revealed things about the Protestant Reformation. This is the first time such a beast is mentioned in the book of Revelation. And because this beast comes out of the bottomless pit, we have to assume that it has something to do with the Reformation. Earlier we said that the Reformation was definitely a work of God, and it was. So how could this moving of God that restored clarity of, on salvation and other critical truths of the Gospels have anything to do with the beast? The word beast in Greek does not denote a tame domesticated animal that serves mankind. Rather it denotes a wild beast, something that is dangerous. Also from this point on in the Revelation, the concept of the wild beast appears numerous times. So it is important that we capture something of its nature to understand what happens here under the sixth trumpet and as we study the rest of the revelation. Recall that smoke came out of the bottomless pit from which a swarm of locusts emerged whose purpose was to torment men for five months. These locusts, we are told, had a king over them named Abaddon and Apollyon, both names meaning destruction. So this beast that we now see coming out of the pit is King Apollyon, or King Destruction. His destroying nature is evident in that he makes war with the Word of God and the Spirit of God and kills them. And that is, he destroys their influence. The war against the two witnesses was waged mainly through division in the churches. 
Attempts at unity among the reformers were numerous during the Reformation. You may not re have realized that. But certain issues were deemed to be too important to overlook and actually stood in the way of unity. And some of those issues were, but were not limited to, first of all, the meaning of the Lord's Supper. The different reform reformers had different ideas of what happened in the Lord's Supper. Martin Luther was very close to the Roman Church, but the other reformers backed away from Luther and came up with other mysti mystical uh, presences of Christ in the elements of the Lord's Supper. So they could not agree on what the Lord's Supper entails, and that separated the churches. And since the early Reformed churches were protected by their respective governments, national identity was deemed more important than the actual unity of the churches. Okay? Our unity is limited to our nation's boundaries. The Protestant churches in Germany, the Lutherans, were having unity with only the Lutherans. The French church, the, the Dutch church, the Swiss church, the Church of England, they had their unity within their, their countries, but they would not have unity with each other. Yes, representatives from all those churches would come together from time to time over the next several centuries. They would agree on many, many things, but they would never unite as the church of God, the church that Jesus Christ built through salvation, the body of Christ. The Reformed churches tended to identify with their leaders and to distrust the motives of other Reformers, and some more than others. Church organization differed from church to church. Some of these Protestant churches were Episcopal in nature. In other words, they were ruled by bishops that, uh, you know, ruled over certain areas, certain dioceses. Others were Presbyterian in their uh, government. They were ruled by elders elected from the local churches. Men meet together to uh, govern them in their countries. And some were congregational, which means that the congregations were autonomous. They governed themselves. They had no higher government. So that church government stood in the way of unity. The influence of John Calvin had a great deal to do with the separation and division of the Protestant churches during the time of the Reformation. And still today, still today, his doctrine of predestination was highly disputed among the Reformers. And the various churches subscribed to varying and incompatible degrees of that doctrine. Maybe that's difficult to understand until you study comparative theology, which we will not do at this moment in time. But just differing opinions on uh, predestination uh, confuse the theologies of the different Protestant churches. And then we have the unique creeds and confessions of faith of the different churches. However close in content they were, these things restricted each church to their peculiar expression of the Christian faith and disallowed all others. War against the two witnesses. King destruction. Fights against the word and the spirit of God. The war against the two witnesses by the beast of the bottomless pit was subtle rather than a war of direct confrontation as it was under Catholicism. 
an examination of the creeds of the Reformed churches reveals that they all subscribe to the essential doctrines of salvation. And listen to this, they even agreed on the definition of the Christian church. Wow, that's powerful. The Bible during the Reformation was translated into national languages. It was read in churches and it was personally read by literate people that could afford to purchase a Bible. So rather than attacking the Bible and people's access to worship, in other words, the Word and the Spirit, the two witnesses, the structure, practice, and literature, liturgy of the churches stood between the two witnesses and the people so that the witnesses were ineffective. In other words, the churches of the Reformation killed the influence of the two witnesses, substituting membership for salvation. This is one reason why John Wesley, who was a priest in the Church of England and had done missionary work in North America, was not actually saved from sin until he heard sound preaching on the gospel from the Moravians at Aldersgate in May of 1738. Verse 8 in our text says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The Reformed churches acknowledge the Word and Spirit, but rendered them ineffective through ritual and division. Ritual, killing the effectiveness of the Word of God, and division, killing the effectiveness of the Spirit of God. But the Reformed churches never tried to do away with the Word and Spirit as did the Catholic churches. Rather, they displayed them in their forms of worship as something essential but mostly inaccessible. Their bodies were dead but visible in the street of what is identified as the great city called Sodom and Egypt. What in the world do we mean by that? Well, Sodom was a place of sexual immortality. Immorality, let me say <laughs> add that too. <laughs> sexual immorality, in other words, fornication. Now, if you recall our study of the letters to the seven churches of Asia, we found out that spiritual fornication exists exists when churches unite people with themselves instead of with Christ. In simple words, church joining and corporate membership. It's one reason why in the Church of God we don't believe in formal membership. Membership is through the blood of Christ as you're born again and added to the body of Christ. If you are among the redeemed, if you are saved, you are a member of God's church and we accept you as such. The only role book this church, this congregation has of its membership is the Lamb's Book of Life. And we don't get to put names in there or out of there. The Lamb does that. Thank God for that. He never makes a mistake. He never adds anyone that shouldn't be there. And thank God he never takes out anyone who is there. Thank God for that. And Egypt was a place of bondage. Without preaching the gospel that they professed to believe, the churches of the Reformation were unable to bring people to a saving relationship with Christ and left them in the bondage of sin. This city is the place where our Lord was crucified. King destruction causes the Lord to be crucified 
when he causes people that were enlightened with the gospel to fall away into sin as we read in Hebrews chapter 5 verses 4 through 6 where it says for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come here we see both of the witnesses right if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify, crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame this is what King destruction did in the Reformation people would be saved as they heard the gospel but there was no sustaining Word of God to feed and to encourage the great number of people and so church joining church membership was substituted for the actual work of salvation the Reformation may have eventually killed the influence of the word and the spirit in the general work of the church but thank God it did not abolish them as did the Roman and the Orthodox churches the leaders of the Reformation would not allow the word and spirit to be buried but displayed them in their creeds their confessions and their catechisms under the Reformation and in Protestant denominational churches it was possible for people to hear the gospel and be brought into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and many people did but perhaps many more people were just church members and if you would read the creeds of the Protestant churches you find out that they admit the great majority of the people were merely nominal Christians yet integrated into the recognized memberships of the churches shame and disgrace amen next week we'll be looking at our last lesson on the sixth trumpet so come we will discuss the 42 months the 120 1260 days and the three and a half days find out what the answer is